So let's talk about Zionism. Uh, let's talk about Zionism. So, so let me start by saying Zionism is a package deal. Now, what is a package deal? A package deal is when you have a concept, and in the file folder under this concept, in what goes into the concept, are legitimate things, valid things, basically good things, and invalid things, bad things, illegitimate things. And there was no question that Zionism as a concept is a mixed bag. It has good things, which we will talk about. But it certainly has in there, in this concept, in the way it is used, and by the people who use it, some pretty bad things. And, and there's no question that it's hard or maybe impossible to really disentangle this, particularly given that the Zionists don't seem inclined to want to do that. <laughs> So let's talk about some of the bad things that are in Zionism. Well, in the concept of Zionism is a, uh, a certain collectivism. There's something about Jews and, and, and about, you know, the, the, the Jewish identity, and that identity has some real uh, meaning, influence, significance. And uh, that, uh, you know, being, uh, uh, you know, and, and there's no definition of Jew, of course. Uh, is it a religion? Is it a nation? Is it a tribe? Is it, a, is it ethnicity? And, of course, ethnicity is, as Ayn Rand called it, is a, a, uh, a package deal as well. It's an anti-concept. It, it doesn't really represent, it doesn't capture anything. Is it a culture when we talk about Judaism? So there's very difficult to define what, it means to say one is Jewish, right? And, it, it, and I, I will, when we talk about the positives, I will give you uh, my view on this. So Zionism is a movement of Jews, for Jews, n nobody else. And it is a movement that basically says, it is a movement, an ideology, if you will, that basically says the Jews, uh, and, and this is, again, in, in, in various iterations of the movement. The movement basically says the Jews must go back to their, uh, you know, the land that they occupied 2,000 years ago. So they were kicked out of this land by the Romans in, I don't know, 70 AD or some years after 7 AD, 70 AD after they, they, there was a, a, a revolt against the Roman Empire. And uh, that is their home. That's where they should go back to. Uh, and uh, they have a right to that land, a collectivist, collective right to that land, because they were there 2,000 years ago. They were there first. And since then, by the way, since the Roman Empire ruled over uh, Palestine, uh, they called it Palestine at the time, uh, there has been no nation state in that territory. It was the, uh, it was the uh, uh, Romans, then it was the Byzantines, then it was a variety of different Arab empires, the Abbasids, the uh, Umayyads, the uh, uh, Mamluks, I think, and then it was the Ottomans, and then it was the British. But it never, there was never a state there, never a country belonging to a people, and therefore, we are the last people to have a state there, and therefore it's ours. Now, that is collectivist, that is ancient history, that is irrelevant to anything, and, and, but that is part of a big part of Zionism. Right? So uh, this is a Jewish movement to bring Jews together in a land, in the land of their ancestors, to form a state. And if that was it, then Zionism would be a bad thing, just in and of itself, if that was all of it. And I can understand why people think of Zionism as a ethnocentric, nationalistic, collectivistic, and for some people, certainly religion-based ideology. And that is, that is, uh, for a lot of, unfortunately, Zionists, that's exactly what it is. But Zionism did not start out like that. And I don't think that the main, the main push 
of Zionism was really that. There were always elements of collectivism. There were some elements of religion. And there was always elements of this ancient land that belongs to us. But that is not true for the founder of the movement, uh, Herzl. Herzl is the man who founded the Zionist movement in the, in the uh, final decade of the 19th century. And Herzl was a completely secularized and, from his perspective, assimilated Jew in, uh, who lived in Austria. Uh, he thought of himself as an Austrian, as a European, as a man even of the Enlightenment. He was a liberal, liberal in the sense back then, and uh, he was, uh, he was uh, you know, he, he, I don't think he considered himself much of a Jew at all. Until he was assigned to France, where he was assigned to cover the Dreyfus trial. And Dreyfus was a uh, senior officer in the French army, a well-respected officer in the French army, you know, admired, respected, had done a, a good job. And then um, Dreyfus was accused of spying for the Germans. I think the trial started in, eight, in the 1890s. It, it, the whole affair only ended in, I think, 1902, 1903, because it, it then was, there was a retrial, and, and, and then there was a pardon by the president of France. It was a complicated episode. But in the trial, it became evident, it became you know, uh, uh, obvious, that the reason Dreyfus was being persecuted was not because he was guilty. But the reason he was being persecuted and the reason prosecuted and the reason he was being persecuted and the reason he was found guilty was because he was Jewish. You know how Tucker Carlson said about Ben Shapiro the other day, he's a Jew first and an American second. He's got split alliances. Well, that was accusation made against Dreyfus. We can't trust him as a Frenchman because he's a Jew. And his alliance, first of all, is to the Jews. And he would sell us out to the Germans in this case, even if, uh, even if, uh, if it served the Jewish interests. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so Herzl, so this, uh, in, um, uh, so this, the Dreyfus trial, and he came to the conclusion, and a pretty stunning conclusion at the end of the 19th century, that if France, the most liberal of countries in a sense, or maybe second to England, a country that had, you know, egalitarianism and that had dismissed religion, that try to strive towards viewing people and judging people as individuals if in France anti-Semitism was alive and well, then anti-Semitism was somehow endemic to Europe of the time and probably of the future. Now, just to be clear, at the same time as this was happening, in Russia, in Ukraine, in Lithuania, in Poland, Regular pogroms against the Jews, where Jews were killed, in, uh, you know, on large scale, raped, butchered, looted, were happening. Jews were fleeing the, the mass migration of Jews to places like the United States during this period, uh, a direct consequence of the pogroms going on in Eastern Europe uh, during this period. So. But Herzl's attitude was, well, that's Eastern Europe. They, they were a little barbarian. They, they, they were a little barbaric. That, that doesn't count, right? Even then, Russia was not a, a, a great place. But it's, it's, it's France. It's Western Europe. It's the peak of civilization. And anti-Semitism is here as well. And it was vile. 
I mean, there's literally a publication in Paris, a newspaper called The Anti-Semite, that published vile stories about, you know, the Jews, the Rothschilds, all the, all the, and, and published, I think, uh, you know, translations of the Elders of Zion, this booklet about the conspiracy of the Jews to take over the world that was created by the Russians in Odessa, actually, today Ukraine, uh, as, uh, you know, to justify their anti-Semitism and their, and their hatred of the Jews. So he came to the conclusion, look, the Jews need to leave Europe. The Jews need to get out of here. Anti-Semitism is everywhere. It's only going to get worse, according to his analysis. I don't think he really foresaw the Holocaust, but he foresaw something very similar. And he realized that Europe was heading in that direction. And for that, it, it really is amazing that he managed to see that. And what he said was, in order for Jews to defend themselves, they must come together as a nation, not a, not a, not a religion. He was completely secular. Uh, not a religion, uh, a, 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 not some collectivistic attitude, but a nation in order to defend themselves, in order to stand up against the world. And he foresaw such a nation as being a nation that was liberal, again, in the classic liberal sense, a, a, a free nation, a nation that wherever it was geographically, the native people would be part of this nation. It wouldn't be just Jews. It wouldn't be a, a, a nation that discriminated. It wouldn't be, it would be a, 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 a free, liberal, you know, not perfect. He believed in public education and government education and government investments and all kinds of mixed economy stuff. But as good as it got in, in, in kind of the late 19th century, early 20th century, in terms of perspective on, um, on uh, you know, uh, politics. Uh, originally, uh, he, he was really serious about an idea of doing this in South America. He thought South America was this vast expanse where uh, there was a lot of open space. And he thought it was possible to negotiate a deal with Argentina or Brazil or somewhere around there and, and establish a Jewish state in South America. And, and uh, a lot of his writings describe this Jewish state that's going to be in South America. And he, and he talked to kind of the, the, the wealthy Jews about the potential of, in a sense, bribing a country. You know how in Honduras now they're trying to set up a, a free, like a in, independent uh, city state within Honduras that will have its own laws and all of that. Well, there's a sense in which Herzl wanted to do this in South America in that, you know, for, for, for Jews. On the principle of Jews can come there, but it's going to be a, a, a kind of a European country. It's going to be a civilized, free, liberal country. When South America it turned out not to work, uh, and uh, he appealed to the British, and there was discussions with the British, the British at some point offered Uganda and Herzl got all excited about Uganda, and, and uh, it actually got, came to a vote among the Zionists about whether to go to Uganda or not, and it was voted down. But Herzl voted for it because he didn't care about where it was. It was the principle was, was vote. It wasn't about the land. It wasn't about the geography. It wasn't about the holy land. But for some in the Zionist movement, Zionist movement, it was. This is why it's a mixed bag of good people and bad people and a movement that doesn't have a clear, unequivocal agenda. Finally, it was obvious that uh, the most successful attempt would probably be to go to Palestine. Uh, it, it, by that point, there were already significant numbers of Eastern European Jews moving to Palestine uh, and trying to, um, uh, trying to create a, um, uh, to, to build, start building agricultural institutions and other kind of institutions uh, in Palestine. So Herzl accepted that. He spent a lot of time trying to lobby the Ottoman Empire to allow for uh, expanded Jewish immigration 
and ultimately to provide some kind of autonomy or sovereignty to a Jewish state uh, in Palestine. That failed, and he died very young. So he never actually saw the, the, the development of the state of his dream. Uh, he never saw it come to reality, uh, uh, to reality uh, at all. Indeed, 50 years after he wrote something like, you know, 50 years from now, you know, I, I will not see this, you know, the Zionist dream become a reality. But I think that 50 years from now, it will be a reality. And exactly 50 years later, uh, after he wrote that, pretty much, yes, it was 1948, uh, Israel came into existence. So he, he was uh, a bit of a prophet, right? <laughs> he was very uh, observant and had a keen sense of the future, of the future. So uh, that is a positive strand within Zionism. It's secular. It's liberal in the positive sense of liberal, generally pro-freedom, generally pro-individual rights, not consistently, nothing like what we would want, but, but in that kind of direction, politically free, treating everybody equal before the law, generally respecting property rights, and free speech and other, of course, individual rights. That is the positive aspect of Zionism. And ultimately, that is what got manifested in the creation of the state of Israel. It's that Zionism that is Israel today. I mean, when you remember when the demonstrations were happening against the legal reform in Israel, I did a show on that and I said, you know, one of the questions is, is Israel a Jewish state or is Israel a state for Jews? And I think this interpretation of Zionism is a state for Jews. And there is a religious, nationalistic, messianic even, interpretation of Zionism that is for a Jewish state. And that is definitely a tension within Israel. And the more Israel becomes a Jewish state in the sense of a religious state, a nationalistic state, a state where people don't have equal rights, the state that might discriminate against some because of their religion or because of their uh, uh, national origin or whatever, to that extent, it, is, it, it becomes illegitimate. But as long as it stays a fundamentally free state with equality before the law, that it, it's only its primary way in which it is Jewish is that it is committed to defending Jews around the world and the primary means by which it defends Jews around the world is that it allows them to emigrate there, then to that extent, it is a legitimate project and a praiseworthy state, a praiseworthy state, a moral state, because it is fundamentally protective of the rights of the individual.